with him. Amen. Come to a garden alone. Praise the Lord this morning. Maybe someone else would like to just uh, give a quick testimony for us this morning. Maybe something God has laid on your heart through one of the songs or just something that you want to share with us this morning. Anyone? Do we have any? I know we do. I know. Well, I don't see. Where'd he go? Mike, 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 Mike. Oh, back, back, back in the back. Or, uh, any other military personnel uh, here with us this morning? Gary? Was. Was. Well, we still appreciate what you've done. Appreciate our military folks, amen, and their families. Uh, we are. Uh, we are able to come in this morning and and gather and, and worship uh, because of, of men and women who have given their lives uh, in the service of our country. And uh, we are a blessed nation because of them. Yeah, yeah. And we need to continue to pray for those who serve and, and uh, those who uh, uh, give their lives uh, for our freedom. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it's something like you're a veteran if you've ever written your name on a piece of paper and basically uh, wrote it down for a blank check uh, in serving your country. Yes. So we appreciate each and every one of them. Yes. Did you get to see those pictures? Did I, did I go too quick on them? Did we go too quick? Some pretty amazing pictures that we have here on the screen this morning. And uh, I share them because I want to talk about this morning of how big God is. I think I've shared with you before and I finally, I found, I found the, 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 uh, little poem or whatever that P.L. Adele, he was an evangelist in the Nazarene church years ago gave this to the folks at the Vienna church when we attended there and he says on here he says you are not discouraged unless the situation you face seems underlines seems S-E-E-M-S -E -E seems bigger than the God you serve how big is your God? How big is your God? In other words, the things and the circumstances in life that we face are truly not as big as God. God is bigger. And so no matter what we're facing today, no matter what we're going through today, God is bigger. And I want to take a, a, a little bit of time the next few weeks and, and talk to you about how big God is. And this morning we're going to talk about what happens when we see God. And it's going to be a study on Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. And, and the, series of the, of the message series are going to be exactly that. How big is God? On, on my way this morning to church, I was very impressed, I believe, from the Holy Spirit from God this morning to just draw our attention to one of the points in this message. And I'm concerned that we become complacent. Yes. Yes. That we go to church and we do all these things and we become death, if you will to what God wants to say to us at times. 
And, and I pray this morning as we, as we continue in this message, in this series of messages, that, that we would open our hearts, open our eyes, so that we might see Jesus. So we might hear from the Holy Spirit. He's here this morning. He wants to speak to each and every one of us. Those words to that song I read off earlier, those aren't just words to a song, as I said. They should be the words of our heart this morning to draw closer to Him. There's a story or a letter that was written by a young boy. His name was Danny and he was eight years old. And uh, Danny wrote the song, Why I Believe in God. He says this, and bear with me, it's a little lengthy, but a great little story. He says, one of God's main, job, main jobs is making people. He makes them to put in place of the ones who die so that there will be enough people to take care of the things here on earth. He doesn't make grown-ups just babies. I think because they are smaller and easier to make. That's way, or that way he doesn't have to uh, take up his valuable time teaching them how to talk and walk. He can leave that up to mothers and fathers, and I think that works out pretty good. God's second most important job is listening to prayers. An awful lot of this goes on because some people like preachers pray at times other than bedtime. God doesn't have time to listen to the radio or TV on, this, on account of this. And as he hears everything, not only prayers, there must be a terrible lot of noise going on in his ears unless he has thought of a way to turn it off. God sees everything and hears everything and is everywhere, which keeps him pretty busy. So you shouldn't go wasting his time by going over his parents' head and asking him for something that they said you couldn't have. And I think some parent really inserted that. I think, they, I think, I think Danny was getting a little bit of help from a parent on some of this. So anyhow, he goes on, he says, atheists are people who don't believe in God. I don't think there are any that come to my church. Jesus is God's son. He used to do all the hard work like walking on water and doing miracles and trying to teach people about God that didn't want to learn. And they finally got tired of his preaching to them and they crucified him. But he was good and kind like his father and he told his father that they didn't know what they were doing and to forgive them and God said, okay. His dad, God, appreciated everything that he had done and all his work on earth. So he told him he didn't have to go out on the road anymore. That he could stay in heaven. And so he did. Now, his helps, now he helps his father out by listening to prayers and seeing which things are important to God to take care of and which ones he could take care of himself without having to bother God. He's like a secretary, only more important, of course. He can pray any time you want, and they are sure to hear you because they got it all worked out so that one of them is on duty at all the time. You should always go to Sunday school because it makes God happy. It makes me happy, too. <laughs> it makes me happy. Sunday school. Everybody ought to go to Sunday school. Amen? I hope that uh, I hope you're I hope you're thinking about it. Maybe you've been thinking about it for a long time, but Sunday school is important. Church it really is. He goes on. He says you should always go to Sunday school because it makes God happy. And if there is anybody you want to make happy, it's God. I don't believe that. I don't believe in. If you don't believe in God besides being an atheist, you will be very lonely because your parents can't go with you everywhere like camp, but God can. It's good to know He is around when you're scared of the dark and when you can't swim very good and you get thrown into real deep water by big kids. 
But you shouldn't always just think of what God can do for you. I figure that God put me here and He can take me back anytime He pleases. And that's why I believe in God. <laughs> I, I, I tell you, aren't kids amazing? Aren't they just something that, that uh, sometimes we ourselves uh, overlook some of the, some of the simple things yes. about faith? Yes. Uh, it reminds me of the story of a happy couple who came home from the hospital with a brand new baby boy. They put him in the crib, and as they left the bedroom, his older brother snuck into the room where his brother was going to sleep, and he looked at him through the bars in the crib, and he whispered, tell me before you forget, what does God look like? <laughs> Children are truly a blessing from God. Amen? Amen. And a lot of people would really like to know what God looks like. And in our passage this morning, we're, we're going to see an individual that was able uh, to see exactly uh, what God looked like. The passage, once again, is Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. If you found that or if you want to follow along on the screen this morning you are more than welcome to but would you stand as we honor the reading of God's word this morning Isaiah chapter 6 verses 1 through 13 in the year that King Uzziah died I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up and the train of his robe filled the temple Above it stood seraphim, each one had six wings, and with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory, glory, and the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. And so I said, woe is me, I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphims flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips and your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. And also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and tell the, this people, Keep on hearing, it, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and shut their eyes lest they see with their eyes and hear their, with their ears and understand with their heart and, and return and be healed. And then I said, Lord, how long? And he answered, until the cities are laid waste and without an inhabitant, the houses are without a man, the land is utterly dust desolate, the Lord has removed men far away and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. But yet a tenth will be in it and will return and by, by, be a, for consuming as a terebinth tree or as an oak whose remains, or stump remains when it is cut down. So the holy seed shall be its stump. Father, we thank you today for your word and for what you mean to us. We pray, Father, that as we as we look into your word this morning, that you would open our hearts and, and the Holy Spirit would give us reasoning and understanding, uh, Lord, of what, what it is that you want for us this morning. Be with each and every one of us, thou Lord, in Christ's name we pray, and amen. You may be seated. As you read this passage of scripture, you can't help but recognize that there are two groups of people represented in this passage. 
The first six verses are about Isaiah's vision of God. And, 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 and you could say that this is, a, is, is what uh, Isaiah is, is, is represents those who, who see God and, and what happens when we see God. Verses 9 through 13, however, represents the group that does not see God. And, and so I want to start with the second group first this morning. And look at what happens when we see God. What happens, or the question that I should say is, why do people fail to see God clearly? Why do people fail to see God clearly? Well, you can't rule out that one of the reasons I think people fail to see God clearly is because of their rebellion. Friends, when you rebel against God, when you go against what you know God wants you to do, when you sin, if you will, what do I mean by the word sin? Well, let me just give you a, a simple definition, and I've given uh, out some handouts in your bulletin this morning, and, and follow along. You can fill in the blanks this morning to help you along. But a simple definition of sin is this. It is a willful disobedience to the known law of God. It's a willful disobedience to a known law of God. So sin is when I knowingly and willingly and, and disobey what I know God wants. Amen? He told Adam and Eve in the garden... You can eat of everything in the garden, but of the tree in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, do not eat. That was just one thing that they had to obey. It was one command that God had given them. And sin started because of disobedience. Yes. Sin started because man thought they could know what God knows. That being the case, then when we sin, it is not by accident. You, you hear what I'm saying this morning? If, if you fall short, if you snap at somebody because you're, you're tired and hungry and, and upset, that's falling short. That's missing the mark. Especially if you, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Please forgive me. Amen? The Holy Spirit will check your heart. But if you go out here and you know you got, you know that Snicker bar on the counter in, in the store is, is, is delicious and has that caramel gooey stuff and all those peanuts in it, and you, and you take that candy bar and you stick it in your pocket knowing right there tells you you know that's wrong because you're hiding it, amen? amen. <laughs> that is sin. Yes. 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 When we sin, we know exactly what we are doing. When we sin like this, I'll guarantee you this. And we talked a little bit about it in Sunday school class. And if you've been in Sunday school class, you would know this. I guarantee you this. It will prevent you from seeing God. There will be no sin in heaven. If your loved one has died and gone on into heaven, you know they were a saint of God, and, and, and you're a sinner, if you're a sinner, you will not see them again. Sin separates us from God. And when you and I rebel against God, if we continue to engage in an activity that, that we know God doesn't want us to do, that we are sinning. And when we refuse to believe that there is a God, or when we refuse to believe that He is interested in our lives, I can promise you that we will fail to see God. Isaiah 9 through 12, once again, it says this. 
And he said, go and tell this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and shut their eyes lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed. Then he, I said, how long? Lord, how long? And he answered, until the cities are laid waste and without inhabitant, the houses are without a man, the land is utterly desolate. And the Lord has removed men far away and has forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. Now, in the Living Bible, going back to verses 9 and 10, it reads like this, a little plainer for us, I hope. But here's what it says. It says, and he said, yes, go, but tell my people this, though you hear my words repeatedly, you won't understand them. Those who rebel against God, if you keep doing it, eventually you'll hear his words, but you will not understand them. It's not that God quits or gives up on us. It's that we have rebelled and turned against God so far and so deep that we have shut Him out. Men, we're good at this. Not towards God, but toward our wives sometimes. They start talking to us and we can turn that selective hearing on and continue to watch the ball game and say, yes, dear, every now and then, but not hear a word they're saying. I see some ladies looking around at their husbands and poking them in the sides. He got your number. <laughs> I got your number because that's the way I am. You won't understand him. Though you watch and watch as I perform my miracles, still you won't know what they mean. We'll see God working. We'll see Him doing wonderful things. And yet, we will not understand what He's doing. She, he goes on to say, Dull their understanding, close their ears, and shut their eyes. Folks, it's going to happen. Our eyes and ears are going to close to the things of God if we keep rebelling against God. If we keep going our way instead of God's way. He goes on and says, I don't want them to see or to hear or to understand or to turn to me to heal them. My friends, I don't know about you, but that's a graphic picture of people who have decided to rebel against God. I, I know some are probably saying, how can that happen? How can, how can people see and hear the things of God and, 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 and not perceive it? Well, that's exactly what happened in Jesus' day. In Matthew 13, we, we find the parable of the sower. And, and, and this is the very first parable Jesus told. Up until this point, he taught with great clarity. In fact, after his Sermon on the Mount, the people were all amazed with his authority and, and his clarity of his teaching. And then in Matthew 13, Jesus completely changes his style of teaching. He goes from speaking clearly and concisely to speaking in parables. And immediately, the disciples go to Jesus, and in verse 10, they ask, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he goes on in verses 14 and six through 16, and he says this. And in them the prophecies of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, remember the verses we just read a little while ago in Isaiah 9 through 13? Here it is being fulfilled. Here it is being fulfilled in the New Testament with Jesus he goes to say, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull, and their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes have, have, they have closed, lest they should see with their ears and hear with their eyes or ears, 
lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Yes. In verses 14 through 16, as I said, Jesus quotes the Old Testament prophecy of Isaiah 6, 9 through 10. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. The people have been exposed to the clearest teachings of Jesus, yet they rejected His teaching. These rejections, they led to the closing up of their understanding. And we sit and we read the record and we ask, why couldn't they understand what Jesus was telling them? I mean, it's so clear. Jesus was standing right before you folks and, and you just didn't get it. Hasn't the thought ever occurred to you when you read passages, especially in the Old Testament, you know, with all the prophets... That God, I mean, God spoke through these prophets. He, he warned them. He, he told them things that were going to happen. He not, was not only foretelling, but forthtelling. Things that are going to be happening right now in their time. And he had these prophets. And, he, and, 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 then, and then all the miracles that, you know, Moses and, and, and others had, had done right before their eyes. The parting of the Red Sea and all those things that, that they seen with their own eyes. Yet the people didn't get it. Well, the explanation for that is really relatively simple. As soon as the people begin to turn their back on the Lord and His instructions, their rebellion automatically results in the closing down of their understanding to the point where Jesus was standing right in front of them and they could not comprehend that He was the Messiah. The, prophet, the, the religious leaders of their days, if anybody should have known this was the Messiah, it should have been them. But they're the one that crucified him. The same thing happens today, church, and I'm, I'm, it, it, it bothers me, it hurts me. You share the things of God and, and, you, and, you, and you teach the things of God and, 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 you, and people see the miracles of God taking place in their lives and, and how God protects them and, and, and gets them through an illness or, or a, a, a catastrophe in their lives. And, and if we're not careful, folks, we, we come to the church and, and we sit in the sanctuary and, and we sit in our Sunday school classes and, and we hear the Word of God taught and we hear the Word of God preached and we, we sit under the teaching hour after hour after hour, week after week, and month after month, and year after year, and if we're not obedient to the light, to the teaching, to the preaching that we receive, we end up turning our back and persistent in our way, and the result is always the same. Our understanding begins to close down. And that's what God impressed on my heart this morning. How many are sitting in our pews today, not just here, I'm not just referring to us, church, but I'm referring to the church. How many are sitting in our pews today for years and yet don't understand what God is saying to them? Maybe it's a very significant sin that threatens you. And if you engage in it, and you continue to engage in it, you'll lose your integrity. You'll lose your joy. You'll lose your family maybe, and maybe you'll lose so much more. A friend comes and they stand before you 
that God has laid it on their heart to go talk to you. They say to you, can't you see it? Don't you see what you're doing? Don't you understand what this will do to you and to your family? And you just don't understand it. Everyone else can see it. But you can't. You notice Isaiah? <laughs> uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> Why is it we can see other people's sin before we see our sin? You see, the result of closing down that conviction that came to you is dangerous, my friend. Conviction is a good thing. We should never turn away. When God convicts our heart, we should never turn it away. And let me tell you this. It happened to the people in the Old Testament. And it happened to the people in Jesus' day. And there He stood right in front of them. And they could not understand. And they could not see. It starts with something small. You know, should get things right. How many of us have said that before? I need to get things right. I need to get right with the Lord. And you sense God's hand of conviction on your life. Yet you're unwilling to make a sacrifice. You're unwilling to accept the teaching. You're unwilling to make that commitment. And you turn your back on that conviction. And you endure that conviction. And before long it goes away. Then, you, then, then when the time comes and, 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 and your future is at stake and your family is at stake and your kids is at stake and your marriage is at stake and, and your, your job's on the line and, and your very soul is at stake, you won't see it you won't understand it because you're ever hearing but yet not understanding. You were ever seeing yet not perceiving. Your heart has become calloused. Otherwise you might see and hear and understand and turn to God and be saved. Be forgiven. But now you can't because your heart has become hard and you'll never see or never will see God again. Church, I'm afraid that comes too often too many times. Oh, the terrible, ruthless cost of rebellion. Psalms 95 last part of verse 7 and the first part of verse 8 it says today if you will hear his voice do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion and so there you have it verses 9 through 13 representing the group of people and why they fail to see God clearly and I'm glad there's none here today because the very fact that you're here today tells me that God is still working in our lives. Amen? God has still brought us to a place where we can hear and see what He wants to say to us. Amen. And so, my second part is, is what happens when we see God clearly. And you're here this morning, so we're all here, and we actually see God clearly. I believe that with all my heart this morning. You see, Isaiah went through a, if you will, a fourfold process when he came into God's presence. The first thing that happened when he saw God clearly is that it begins with confusion. It begins with confusion. Seeing God clearly begins with confusion. It says in the year King Uzziah died. This was a terrible time for the people of Isaiah's day. King Uzziah had been an awesome king who had reigned for 52 years. 
He was a lot of uh, he was all a, a lot of the people knew in that day. Most of them did not know any other king other than King Uzziah. Or a lot of people at least. He had provided security and prosperity for the people and now he was gone. Ripped out of their lives. <laughs> it was a terrible, terrible year in the year that King Uzziah died. And sometimes our search for God begins when, when we begin to see God clearly when all of a sudden, a, a, if you will, a King Uzziah in our lives is taken away. Something close to us, something important to us is taken away. It could, be, it could be someone or it could be something that has been very important to us, very precious to us, very dear to us. And now it's taken away and there is a tremendous pain. It's like hitting, if you will, rock bottom. Down as low as you can go. It brings confusion. But seeing God almost always begins with confusion. The second thing we see here about seeing God clearly that Isaiah mentions or talks about is in confession. Seeing God clearly results in confession. Isaiah's natural response to seeing God is to admit that there was something wrong in his life. The natural response to seeing God for you and me is to admit that we are sinners. It brings confession. When we see God in spite of ourselves, we see our lowliness. We see our sin. And the closer you get to God, the more keenly you understand that you have sinned against Him. And you do everything and you want to do everything to make things right. When, when I first got saved, I, I wanted everything that God had for me. And I searched the scriptures and, 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 and got involved in things. That, and and I, I wanted everything that God had for me. And the closer you draw to God, the more you understand the attitudes. And, and, and really the reality comes to one day you realize that there's a carnal nature in you that needs to be sanctified. And that's something that needs to be done in your life. And the farther away that we are from God, the more we think that we're just fine. And that's the dangers of sitting in our pews and never seeing and never hearing. Because we think we're fine. We think we're okay. But yet when Isaiah saw this incredible vision of God, his response was, Woe to me, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. Did you hear that? He recognized his sin before he recognized his neighbor's sin. When we don't see and hear, we recognize their sin before we recognize our sin. But when we clearly see God, we worry about me and my sin. What's the old thing? Point a finger at a person, you only got one point at them, but you get three pointing back at you. And only one sticking up. It's the only place you're going to get help for that. Amen. I never thought about that. He's our help. Amen? Amen. He's our help. He's our help, church. Seeing God made him understand his conviction and that, that, that he needed to, to confess his sin and he says woe is me I'm a man for I am a man of unclean lips Isaiah seeing God clearly results in change
seeing God clearly brings confusion, confession, but it also results in change, church. The moment that Isaiah confessed his sinfulness, look at what happens in verse 6 through 8. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having his hand in his, in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is purged. And also I heard with the, vo or the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and whom shall go for and then he said, Here I am, send me. And he said, Go and tell this people to keep on hearing, but do not understand, to keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Folks, I want you to circle the word in verse 6, or underline it, the word then. And then do the same thing for verse 8, then. Then, then one of the seraphims flew to me with a live coal in his hand. With it he touched my mouth. Then I heard the voice of the Lord. When did God touch him? When did God change him? When did God speak clearly to him and give him an undeniable direction for the rest of his life? After he had confessed. He confessed, then one of the seraphims flew. He confessed, and then he heard the voice of God saying, It is really true that one of the times that we change in our lives is when we hurt bad enough that we have to. When, we, when there is enough confusion in our lives that we turn to God, when confronted with His greatness and His humbleness, we ourselves confess our sins in our lives. Second Chronicles 7.14 It says this, If my people, which are called by my name, and I believe church, that, that applies to you and me today. I believe this applies to the Christian people today. We are His people today. We are the people of God today. We are the ones called to be a light. We are the ones called to, 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 to be the church, if you will. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. When, if my people, that's when, when you and I change, when you and I care enough about, the, about those who are hurting and, 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 and lost in sin this morning. God is in the people changing business. He can change your life through, the, through all the confusion that might be happening. He can change your life with your confession and He can change you. The last step real quickly that Isaiah took when he saw God clearly is it resulted in his commitment. It resulted in his commitment. Verse 8, the Scriptures once again, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and whom shall I go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. It resulted in commitment. It resulted in following God and doing what He here am I send me I love weddings I, I really do one of the greatest part of the weddings is when a couple does their wedding vows you know I so and so take so and so to be my lawfully wedded husband wife whatever to having to hold to, from this day forward for better or worse richer poor sickness and hell and, and, and enjoy and sorrow to love and to cherish to be faithful to you alone as long as we both shall live <laughs> and sometimes the, the tears just start boiling up inside of me 
the emotions well up. And I think about this husband and this wife who have just unreservedly committed themselves to each other, not knowing what the future holds. But yet they've made that commitment. They're going, to, they're, going, they're going to be some tough times. There's going to be some good times. And yet, the husband and wife commit to each other for life. And it's a beautiful thing to think that God, who knows the future, and those who don't know the future, they stay true to those vows throughout their walk together. It amazes me that we are willing to commit ourselves to become one flesh with another human being that we know has flaws and weaknesses, who is not perfect, yet we don't hesitate giving those vows. We know they're going to... She's not my wife. She's perfect. Okay, she's... <laughs> But her husband, ah, she made that commitment knowing all my things and not knowing some of the others. She made that commitment. We're willing to do that with another individual who does not change unless God changes. Yet, we hesitate to commit ourselves fully to God. The one who offers us hope and life, the one who does not change, He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The one who knows every detail of your life and is so powerfully and in control of the universe. On your notes there this morning, I want to challenge you in closing this morning on this, if you will, the last Sunday of the church year. The last Sunday of our church year. Next Sunday begins the new church year for our church. But I would like for you to list anything that you need to confess or maybe change or commit to. I challenge you to do that this morning. Pray and ask God what's on your heart. Is there something this morning that you need to confess? Is there an attitude that needs to change? Is there a behavior that needs to change? Is there a sin that you're hiding? Is there something that only you and God knows about? Or maybe there's a commitment you need to make to God this morning. A commitment, as we said, we're starting a new church here. we got a lot of things that we would like to see in our church as ministries and so forth and so on. Maybe God has laid it on your heart. when you're lacking a commitment. God can use you in ways that you can't imagine. He can use each and every one of us in one way or another. So I pray this morning that, that uh, we continue to listen and hear what God has to say to us. Stand with me as we pray. Father, as we come to the close of this service this morning, we just ask that you be with each one here this morning, Father. And they're here because they've heard. It's not by accident. They, they felt something inside them or they felt something in the need to be in your house today. Each and every one of us are here for a reason. So, Lord, use us this morning. 
help us, Lord, to, to just draw closer to You, to be the man or the woman, the boy or the child, the girl or the young lady, to be the one that stands out and stands up for You in our lives, in our schools, in our homes, in our communities. Help us to be the individual You want us to be. Go with us, Lord, as we depart from here. And bring us back to the next appointed service. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.